brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala, amma ba'd. My dear respected brothers and sisters across America, I welcome you to this uh, study of the Tafsir session of Surah Al-An'am. Again, today we're going to be studying the verses, uh, verse number 40, all the way till verse number 50 of Surah Al-An'am. And inshallah, we will go right to it, inshallah, with Imam Jawad Ahmad. Assalamu alaikum, Imam Jawad, and please begin, inshallah. Wa alaikum salam, wa my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, we continue from where we left off last Wednesday. We had completed verse number 39, Surah Naam, and today we'll continue with, surah, with verse number 40, inshallah, and try to end by verse number 50. So there's about 10 verses to uh, complete, inshallah, today. Continuing in the topic and theme we discussed last uh, Wednesday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the mushrikeen of Mecca and their rebelliousness and rejection and also the adab and punishment that he um, would uh, uh, show them in terms of as a reminder, as a warning to come back to the deen of Allah. So verse number 40, Allah says, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتَكُمْ إِنْ أَتَاكُمْ أَذَابُ اللَّهِ أَوْ أَتَاكُمُ السَّاءَ أَغَيْرَ اللَّهِ تَدْهُونَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Allah is saying to the mushrikeen of Mecca that you don't have any God besides Allah because if Allah were to punish you then there is no one besides Allah whom you can call upon as a savior, as a protector. So in this ayah there is negation um, negation of deity, negation of authority, negation of assistance. In other words, the true meaning of Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, is described in this ayah. In this ayah, Allah is saying, look, you have nowhere to run or hide. You have nowhere to go except to Allah SWT. So therefore, it's better to repent and make tawbah, reconcile with Allah SWT. Allah loves you and wants you back. Uh, in other words, Allah is saying, if you, O oh human being, are thinking that you can rebel against Allah, and find other assistants or deities or Lord that would help you uh, against Allah SWT, then you are mistaken. That is not going to happen, certainly. And that is why Allah SWT says, In kuntum sadiqeen, if you are truthful. See the ayah, Allah ends with, In kuntum sadiqeen, meaning if you are true in your claim, then you could go and call upon other God. But they know even themselves. In other words, this last part of the ayah is a, a denial statement uh, that they know, the Quraysh, the Makkans, they know they have no gods besides Allah to call upon. They know very well that the idols that they worship, the statues they worship, they can't aid or help or do anything. And that is why Allah is saying, In kuntum If you are really truthful in your claim that your gods will help you and assist you against Allah SWT, then go ahead and call upon them. You know, and that is why Allah says uh, that you know if the if the hour sa'a comes, the day of judgment comes, or azab comes, call upon your Lord or so-called false deities, so-called false lords, call upon them to save and protect you. Next ayah, Allah says 41, ayah number 41, <laughs> No, he is the only one you could call upon, meaning Allah is the only one. And it is upon Allah's wish and will that he could remove the affliction that you made, <clears throat> that made you invoke him. So whatever calamity, affliction, trouble you are in, O Quraysh of Mecca, which came to you because Allah warranted that to happen. So you call upon Allah to relieve yourself from that calamity, that hardship. And then he says, only then will you forget whatever you associate with him in worship. In other words, whatever shirk they were doing, whatever idol they were worshiping, they'll forget that at the moment that they call upon Allah for aid and assistance, at the moment that they call upon Allah to help them get out of their trouble or hardship or predicament at that moment they forget about their gods 
And that's what Allah SWT is saying. This is a very common thing that, you know, even like atheists, people who don't believe in God, if they are in a very tragedy, if they are in an emergency, for example, they have, they have a car accident or they're about to fall off a cliff or fall off a bridge, even an atheist, you know, spontaneously says from the tongue, oh my God. And then they try to come to their senses. No, no, no. They say, oh my goodness or oh my gosh. But it's human nature that from your tongue comes out the word of God. No matter how much you deny it, how much you suppress it, deep down in our hearts, we know that there's only one sole power that is the supreme power of this universe. Verse number 42, Allah SWT then continues to inform about the Quraysh. And Allah says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمَّمِ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ فَخَزْنَهُمْ بِالْبَعْسَاءِ وَذَرَّاءِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَرَّاءِ This is a very eye-opening ayah. Allah is warning the Quraysh now, after the previous two ayahs he told them, Allah is now warning the Quraysh, the Meccans, that indeed we have sent messengers before you, O Prophet ﷺ, to other people. So this is a warning to the Quraysh to tell them that, look, other people, other nations before the nation of Quraysh, they were sent prophets also. And when they were sent prophets and they, they did not listen to their prophet's message, Allah SWT gripped them or hold them into hardship. You know, he seized them with ba'sa'i wa dharra'i. Ba's means poverty. It means being poor, you know, losing materialistic possessions in life. Wa and dharr is any kind of harm and affliction, any kind of calamity or hardship that comes, whether it's an accident or sickness or even death is a calamity. So Allah is saying when poverty and hardship afflicts them, uh, why? So that they may repent to Allah SWT and they may immediately humble themselves. You know, so that they may humble themselves to Allah or they may be scared of Allah SWT or they may develop the fear of Allah SWT in their hearts and mind and soul or they may develop the awe and love for Allah SWT when they see the hardship and difficulty and see when they see the poverty they should immediately acknowledge the superpower the supreme power of Allah SWT and humble towards him that we are sorry ya Allah forgive us that is why and that's why Allah says, "La'allahum yatadarrau." La'allahum, it's uh, what we call the cause or reason effect, al-illa. And Allah is saying the reason we send them hardship, the reason we send them calamities, the reason we send them poverty, so that they may humble themselves to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and they realize their helplessness, their uselessness on the earth. Meaning, insan no matter how much ego of the insan rises and they think that, oh, I can do this, I can do that, I am this, I am that. Allah SWT sends a slight affliction, a slight, you know, poverty or a slight kind of hardship and that all ego and, and that all pride, arrogance, boom, goes down. And they realize how helpless and useless they are and how incapable they are to defend themselves See, when Allah decides any affliction or hardship come towards a human being, that human being is helpless in saving or safeguarding themselves from that. What is meant to come, it is meant to come, it will come. And the only thing that can save us from those hardships and tests and trials and tribulation from Allah SWT is obedience, thought, and repentance to Allah, you know, for asking Allah for forgiveness. That can only ensure that Allah doesn't send our way these hardship basa and the raw. Moving on to the next ayah 43, Allah SWT says, Falawla is a is ja ahum basuna the dharra walagin kasat kulu buhum was zayana lahum with shaitan makanu yamalum. Allah SWT now shifts the uh, the theme and topic and says, look, why do they don't hum them humble themselves in for Allah? What is the reason that is making these people suffer so much hardship and calamity, you know, because of um, their hardness and stiffness of the heart. See, the heart has the heart has to be very soft and tender towards the remembrance of Allah. And if the heart is not humbled towards the remembrance of Allah, it becomes hardened. And when the heart is hardened, then the mind is also boldened. 
and then the person makes such drastic bold steps of rebelliousness to Allah SWT. And icing on the cake is that shaitan makes those deeds of theirs, those deeds of rebelliousness, shaitan makes it seemingly fair, you know, fair seeming in their eyes, meaning justifying. Yeah, it's okay, you can do that. Yeah, look, you know, Allah hasn't been good to you, so you can do this act, or you can do this disobedience and sin. You know, Allah has not really helped you and taken care of you. Look how evil or cruel Allah is. So many bad things happen to you in life, so, you know. So this is how shaitan Zayyan lahum shaitan a'malu. Shaitan makes zayyan. Zayyan comes from muzayyan, meaning something that is made glitter and glamorous, something that is attractive, you know, and shiny. So that is what shaitan does. Shaitan makes the rebelliousness, shaitan makes every sin and disobedience very attractive, very glamorous, you know, very, very tempting to the person. And the person slips, slips slowly, slowly, and before long, they know they have fall into error. That is the meaning of Zayyana lahum shaitan a'malum. Shaitan, you know, sows the seeds of dissension. It sows the seeds of defection, deviation from Allah, you know, and, and the person takes baby step. Shaitan is smart, very shrewd. He would not put the whole thing in front of you. He'll put one step, one seed, you one bait. You take that. Then you take a second one. Kind of like what we do when we want to get rid of rats and mouses in our house. You know, what do you do? You put a bait and you put a small bait, you know, in a line so that the mouse or rat takes each one of them until they come finally to the trap and boom, they're trapped. That's what shaitan does. We are technically like rats and mouses in front of shaitan, Iblis. He, he lays the trap for us. We take the bait one at a, one step at a time, and and we are enjoying every time we every time we take a bite, we take a meal, we enjoy, we get satisfied, you know, infatuation. We move forward, take a second and third and fourth and tenth, eleventh until lo behold, he, he, Shaitan has grabbed us the whole and made us do the sin. And after doing the sin, we realize, oh, Shaitan made me do it. No, Shaitan only invited you attracted you you did it yourself so that's why Allah says that you know the only reason shaitan makes things attractive to you is because qasat qulubum walakin qasat qulubum you know qaswa means stiffness hardness see when the heart of the insan becomes hard it becomes easy for the shaitan to occupy the heart overpower the heart of the believer and drag it towards glamorous, glittery, attractive a'mal, things which ultimately make the person deviate from Allah. So that is why the ulama say it's very important to dhikr of Allah, remembrance of Allah, so that the heart is always soft and tender. See, the moment the heart starts becoming harder, it becomes easier. It's like, a, you know, like a dry sponge or like a dry arid stone. It's hard. So it's easy for shaitan to attack it and grab it and lure through the heart, lure the whole insan towards disobedience. But if the heart is soft, moistened with the zikr of Allah, daily habit, we make a daily habit of saying, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar, La ilaha Allah, you know, uh, whatever other askar we have on a daily basis, we do that on a daily basis. It keeps the soft heartedness of the heart, softness. And then it becomes harder for shaitan to attack a soft heart. It becomes harder for shaitan to attack a heart that is busy in the remembrance of Allah. You see, what is the word, what is the dua or dhikr we say the moment we see something that is haram? Let's say our eye comes upon something that we're not supposed to see, something that is naked, nude. Immediately you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. You turn your face away from it, or you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. Let's say shaitan is putting whisper in your mind to do something, to do backbiting. Or to lie. If you say, Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, boom, Shaitan runs away. So the phrase, the key, the key phrase, Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, makes Shaitan go away and the whispers also go away. So every time you get a waswasa of doing something bad, something negative, something horrendous, something disobedient to Allah, every time you get that thought in your mind, immediately recite from your tongue, Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. So that Shaitan runs away, you come back to your senses. And you realize, you know, that what am I doing? Where am I heading? What am I, you know, where am I going? I need to understand and, you know, uh, realize where uh, my relationship is with Allah SWT. Next ayah, uh, 44, Allah SWT says very beautifully, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ 
فتحنا عليهم أبواب كل شيء حتى إذا فرحوا بما أوتوا أخذناهم بغتة فإذا هم مبلسون One of my favorite ayat in the whole Quran because this ayah Allah talks about istidraj Istidraj means that testing of a human being with not hardship but with prosperity, with luxury When, whenever a person is disobedient to Allah and deviating from Allah, when a person is viciously disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yet there is no accountability, there is no you know, holding of them, a meaning in the sense that there is no any kind of sign from Allah that he's upset with them, rather in spite of their disobedience, in spite of their rebelliousness to Allah, they are basking in the luxury and lavishness of this world. That is istidraj. How? Let me explain. See, Allah says, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ When they forgot with what was reminded to them. Let's say Allah sent a sign towards them. You know, let's say Allah sent some a reminder. You know, a sickness, a tragedy, an accident or something that was there as a reminder to wake up from the obliviousness and forgetfulness of Allah. But they forgot that. فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ What happens when they forgot Allah's sign, Allah's reminder coming to them? Then Allah opened the floodgates of luxury. Fatahna. Fatah means open. Fatahna alayhim abwab. We open the doors. Fatahna alayhim abwab kulli shay. We open the doors of everything, meaning it's raining down gold and silver. It's raining down luxuries and lavishness. It's raining down prosperity. And the person is in their foolishness thinking, oh, see, God loves me. Allah loves me so much. You know, I have so much. Look at it. I have so much wealth, so much materialism. My life is so, so you know, so peaceful. Supposedly for them it's peaceful, but it's not. Allah is basically examining them. It's called istidraj. Meaning Allah is upset with them. Allah is mad with them. But instead of, you know, grabbing them by the neck, instead of grappling them into hardship, Allah has opened the floodgates, opened the floodgates of luxury. The Sahaba, when they will recite this ayah, they'll get very scared. They'll be very, they'll immediately make istighfar, astaghfirullah, rabbi, min kulli dhambi, because that is a very dangerous sign. When Allah opens the floodgates of luxury upon you as insan, and you are rebellious to Allah, and still He is opening the floodgates of luxury, understand that Allah is upset, and now He has you know, open these floodgates to test you further that he will then grab you suddenly with a sudden shock. A simple example of this is, you know, many of us Muslims, we sometimes criticize our Muslim leaders. And look at these Muslim, you know, statesmen and leaders of Muslim countries. They are so corrupt. They embezzle funds after funds of the Muslim poor people giving their taxes. And yet they are, you know, they are still in their dictatorship. They're in their authority. Look, nothing happens to them because, and look, they are living in so much luxury. You know, how come God loves them? You know, they do everything wrong. They do everything against the rules of God. They never practice justice. They're corrupt. They do corruption on earth. Yet Allah has given them so many luxury. That is istidraj. No, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah has written them off. Suddenly when baghda, baghda means a sudden shock wave, stunning. Like you get stunned with a stun gun or like a, a you know, electric shock that comes to you like a taser. Z- so it could be a death, meaning the person is basking in the sunshine, the person is really rejoicing in the luxuries of everything, and boom, when Allah holds them accountable, suddenly he gives them death. Or they get a stroke, they get paralyzed, they're bedridden. Or any tragedy that can come to them suddenly. The word baghda means that it comes shockingly and stunningly. You know, baghda then. And then Allah says, then after we have grabbed them suddenly, then they are in despair, they are in misery, they are disheartened. They did not wake up before. For example, somebody doesn't, someone who doesn't pray, doesn't fast, you know, doesn't do any any Islam, doesn't practice anything, and yet they are they are head to toe in full luxury. And you think about it, look, this person is so disobedient to Allah, and Allah has really drowned them into luxuries and materialistic position of this world. Why? Know that there is coming a time, baghta, when there'll be an earthquake, when a sudden shock will come to them, and Allah will snatch away all these things with from them, and on top of that, Allah will put them in extreme punishment, 
could be a terminal illness, cancer, disease, a tragedy, accident, loss, amputation of their body, things like that, stroke, paralysis, bedridden, or worse, the worst, death. Meaning they died in a state of disobedience of Allah. They died in a state of open dis uh, rebelliousness of Allah, yet they were basking in the luxuries and lavishes of the materialistic possession of this world. So that is what Allah is saying, that do not look up to these people, because these people are doomed. You know, Here the scholars of Tafsir also say another important thing, that those people, those human beings who think that this world, this worldly life and the possessions and materialistic are of any value, this ayah negates that. This ayah crushes the thinking that this world the possessions of this world are worthy enough. They're worth nothing. Had they been worthy enough, Allah would never open the floodgates of these mm, luxuries and materialistic possessions on the people who disobey Him. Look at the non-believers. Look at the atheists, those who don't even believe in a God as per se. Allah doesn't starve them to death. Allah doesn't make them homeless. Allah doesn't make them Im impoverished with poverty. They are going about their business. They have, in fact, some of them are basking in the luxury, in the lavishness of materialistic possessions. Why? Because Allah knows that this world means nothing. According to Hadith of Rasulullah, the this whole universe, forget this world, not just this world, but this world and all universe, the galaxies and stars, everything, all universe is not equal to even one wing of a mosquito. This is what Rasulullah said. Don't be sucked in like a magnet to this worldly possession and worldly luxuries. This world is nothing. For us, it's Jannah. Lana fil Jannah. And that is why Rasulullah said that this world and everything in it and beyond that is not even equal to a small wing of a mosquito. Yani the mosquito's wing is better than this dunya. Allah. You know, with all the gold and jewelry and luxuries, with all the lavishness in this world, with all the beauties of the different landscapes on this earth, none of that is even equal to that. A wing of a mosquito is better than that. Now, don't go out there and start gathering all the wings of mosquito things. Oh, this is very valuable. It's more valuable than earth. The purpose of mentioning that example by Rasul is to show that don't ever, ever praise this world. Don't get impressed and impacted and influenced by this world. This world means nothing. It's zero in front of Allah. In fact, it's below zero even. Had it been zero, he would have given it to some people even. But that's the reason Allah is saying that when they forgot what we reminded them with, we opened the floodgates of materialistic luxurious possessions until we grabbed them suddenly. And lo and behold, then they were in extreme despair and misery and remorse and regret, but no use it's too late. Moving on, verse number 45, Allah then tells us that فَقُتِيَ دَابِرُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا وَالْحَمْدُ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ It's amazing, amazing vocabulary of the Quran. Miracle. Allah says فَقُتِيَ قَطَعَ يَقْتَعَ means cut off, you know, like chopped off. So what was دَابِرُ الْقَوْمِ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا Oh my God. Uh, Allah is saying that those people who disobeyed Allah, who did dhulm, who oppressed themselves, you know, uh, they were totally eliminated, whitewashed, you know, obliterated, uprooted um, because of what they did. Meaning Allah did not leave them alive, forget about alive, they were totally uprooted. For example, where are the Qawmi Aad today? Do you see any place on earth with any remnants? No. Where are Qawmi Thamud today? No. Once upon a time, Qawmi Aad and Thamud were way, way, way bigger than any superpower country of the world today. There were civilizations. These two civilizations were so gigantic, mammoth, meaning the whole world used to be dreading in front of them. They were such people who would, you know, point to something and it, it would be done but where are they today not even not even remembered in the books of history not even remembered on the sidewalks and alleys and streets and whatnot very few antique uh, historic antique things may be there in some museum about them but the world and society is very very cruel and has totally obliterated 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them, uprooted them from society, and totally eliminated them. Hmm? That today you don't you don't go to any country to see and remember Qawmi Aad, Qawmi Samud. But once upon a time, they were bigger than 10 superpowers of the world today. That's how big they were. So what is Allah telling us? No matter how big and huge you become, how much powerful you become, how much wealthy and whatnot you become, how much technologically advanced you become, you are useless, helpless in front of the might of Allah. Need I say more from what happened in the recent last two years, the pandemic? Insan, human beings, and all these countries of the world, in spite of all their technological advancement, in spite of all the military arsenal they have, in spite of all the money they possess, and in spite of all the luxuries they had, and all the medical science and technology they had, they could not contain a virus when it was unleashed by Allah. Remember the early days of the pandemic, early days of coronavirus, what happened? It created havoc on earth. People were devastated. People were fearful, scared, you know, nervous, jittery. What's going to happen? You know, they fear death. They don't know if corona comes to you, you're going to die. Well, we're going to die anyway one day. So what's the big thing? The biggest thing that Quran takes out of the mind of the human, uh, Muslim human being, the fear of death. Look, we're all going to die. And we're all going to die one day, one way or another. So why fear death? Death makes you bold in front of calamities and tragedies because, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen? I'm going to die and leave the world. So what? We're going to leave the world anyway. We're going to die anyway. So remember what happened in the early days of pandemic, that nobody could contain it, curtail it, in spite of possessing everything in this world. All the medical professions and all the huge money, Yes, they were able to invent a vaccine and now they're using it and all that. But I'm talking about the initial human being had no defense system against coronavirus. But then that same Allah SWT gave the human being the aql, the fahm, the brain to work and the scientists work and work and came up with some kind of vaccine that can at least salvage some of the damage, do damage control. Yet there is no cure for this coronavirus Till this day, there is no cure. Even today, people are being affected by coronavirus. That means humanity has been helpless and useless in front of this onslaught of the virus. <clears throat> the most we have done as human beings is contain the damage. <clears throat> Even if you're vaccinated and you get COVID, you have symptoms. They're mild or soft symptoms. Or some may not even have any symptoms. But the bottom line is... Uh, Bottom line is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a wake-up call to the people that look, I can, you know, I can literally annihilate you if you rebel against me. Qawmi Aad, Qawmi Thabud were rebellious. They rebelled against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala totally eliminated, evaporated them, annihilated them. It's a reminder that Allah is giving here in this ayah to all human beings and especially the Quraysh who were addressed in this ayah, in this surah. Allah is reminding them that look, don't ever think of rebelling with Allah SWT because this is a losing battle. It's not a winning battle. It's a losing battle. You are at a loss. You would lose for definitely. Hands down, you will lose instantly if you rebel against Allah. So you have no choice but to repent to Allah, to come back to Allah, ruju ila Allah. Then the next ayah, next couple of ayahs, Allah gives further warning. Verse number 47, Allah says, uh, verse 46, sorry, verse 46, Allah says, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ سَمْعَكُمْ وَأَبْصَارَكُمْ وَخَذَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ مَنْ إِلَهٌ غَيْرُ اللَّهِ يَأْتِيكُمْ بِهِ أُنْظُرْ كَيْفَ نُصَرِّفُ الْأَيَاتِ ثُمَّ هُمْ يَسْلِفُونَ this is amazing. Ayah. It sends a chill down the spine. It really scares you up, shivers you. Allah says, Say, O Muhammad to them, you know, Allah is addressing Prophet Muhammad Qul, say to them, say to the Quraysh, Arait, Araitum, have you seen, O people of Quraysh, O Meccans, have you seen, Araitum, in Akhad Allah, if Allah takes away, what? Sam'akum, your hearing, you just can't hear anymore. Wa absarakum, your sight, you have eyes, but you can't see. You have ears, but you can't hear. You have eyes, and you were hearing all the time, you were seeing all the time. But suddenly, Allah, as a punishment, takes the hearing away, takes the eyes away, 
and he puts a seal on the heart. What that means is that a person has no inspiration, motivation to come to Allah, to repent to Allah. So that is what Allah is saying. Ala Man Allah. Then who is there a God besides Allah that would come to rescue you? Are you banking on those idols in Mecca? Are you banking on those statues inside the Kaaba that you put, O Quraysh? Are you thinking they're going to come to save you and protect you? Wrong. They wouldn't. So Allah is reminding the Quraysh and Meccans, and through them in this ayah, Allah is reminding all the human beings today until the day of judgment that, hey, you guys have no choice but to turn back to Allah. You have nowhere to run or hide. You have nowhere to go. And on top of that, if Allah takes your sight, your hearing, or your tongue, or anything, who's going to replace that? There are so many people in this life who were born with hearing and eyesight and everything, and suddenly something happened, a tragic incident happened, some calamity happened, they lost their eyesight, or they lost their hearing. You know, Suddenly one day somebody wakes up and says, hey, I can't see anything. I can't. Allah, Allah can do anything. In this ayah, there is a warning for me and you also, brothers and sisters, us believers, mu'min. That don't take it for granted that if your organs are all functioning perfectly fine for the last so many years since you have been on this earth, don't take it for granted that it will continue to function. If you've been using your eyes and seeing things all your life, don't take it for granted because any day Allah can make you blind. Allah protect all of us from that. Allah is saying, don't take it for granted that you have an ear. You can think. Suddenly Allah can just take away your hearing. You can't hear anything. And Allah is saying, if I do that, if I as Allah do that and take your eyesight away in a snap, take your hearing away in a snap, do you have any doctor, any surgeon, any medicine that can bring that back? No. In, word, in other words, Allah is warning us, the believers, and also the non-believers, that don't take these basic luxuries of life or necessities of life as a given fact. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Repent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, take care of these things that I've given you. Take care of these eyes. Take care of these ears. Take care of this tongue. Take care of this brain. How? How do you take care? By not using them to disobey Allah. If I see something which is disobeying Allah, at that moment, Allah can make me blind. But it's the rahmah, mercy of Allah. He did not give us blindness. You know, imagine you're watching something haram and Allah makes you blind then you can't even see anything. That goes for all those people who watch all kinds of, you know, movies and out there and, you know, all kinds of bad movies online. Some people are addicted to pornography. And that is ridiculous. You know, especially Muslims, believers who are addicted to pornography. Just imagine when they're watching those kind of things and Allah makes them go blind. <laughs> Oh, no one can bring anything. No one in this whole world, the medical doctors and hospital cannot bring that eyesight back if Allah doesn't will. So Allah is saying, why? Why do you disobey? Why do you see haram? Why do you hear haram? Why do you speak haram? If I can make you lose your tongue, lose your eye, lose your ear in a, in a split second, in a snap, it can happen. And that is why people should be dreading, you know, when they are sinning from any organ, from any body part that people use to sin or disobey Allah, they should be dreading that, hey, any moment Allah can grab it, take it away. Then I will be helpless. I'll be useless. And nothing can bring it back. So one of the ways to resist and desist from the disobedience of Allah, from sinning using any of these body parts, is to remember and think, what if Allah makes me this? What if Allah makes me blind? What if Allah makes me mute? What if Allah makes me deaf? If you just bring that thought in your brain, at the moment that you are about to sin, believe you, me, brothers and sisters, you will stop that sinning instantaneously. You will run away from that. You will turn away from that sinning action or deed the moment you bring in your brain the thought that what if Allah makes me blind right now? What if Allah makes me, you know, deaf or dumb right now or, or mute? What would happen? So the person will say, no, 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 I need to protect my body parts. I need to protect my organs. And that's what Allah is saying, that if Allah wants to take away your hearing, your seeing and puts a seal on your heart, 
there is no God besides him that will bring it back. So then Allah ends the ayah by saying, Look how we bring forward our ayats to you and then they turn away from it. Next ayah, ayah number 47. Allah SWT continues in the warning and says, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتَكُمْ إِنْ أَتَاكُمْ أَذَابُ اللَّهِ بَغْدَةً أَوْ جَهْرَةً هَلْ يُهُلَّكُ إِلَّا الْقُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Ask them, O Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that imagine if Allah's punishment were to overwhelm you with or without warning, who would be destroyed other than the wrongdoers? Same thing, same, uh, you know, warning that Allah is saying that, you know, if I grab you or suddenly give you in a sudden instant a destruction, hardship, then who will be lost except for the wrongdoers? Meaning those who are good, those who are muttaqi, they will always be saved. They will never be disrupted. The God-fearing people will always be saved and protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the disobedient and rebellious people that will be suddenly engulfed, engulfed with the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'll be overwhelmed. They'll drown in the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there'll be no savior for them. No, sir, no one will ever be able to save a person that is doomed by Allah SWT. And that's what Allah SWT is saying in this ayah, that don't risk it. Don't go that far of obliviousness and ignorance and neglection that you keep, that Allah keeps sending reminders, you keep neglecting them, you keep ignoring them, and then ultimately Allah will then grab you suddenly with a punishment, with a sudden shock and stunning Thing that the person will be helpless and useless. Next, I have a continue from 48. Allah SWT says in verse 48, Two job descriptions, two fundamental duties of the prophets and messengers are described in here. Meaning every prophet and messenger was sent on the two prong two-pronged attack. So Allah says, وَمَا نُرْسِلُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And we did not send uh, any messenger except as a mubashir. Mubashir, is, it means someone who gives glad tidings, good news. So Allah has sent prophets as people bearer of good news, giving them good news of Jannah, of the luxuries of Jannah, the beauty of Akhirah. So they are always giving them good news and inciting them to strive hard for Jannah. And then the other thing they have, the big job description has mundhirin, indhar, warning. So on one side is abshir, bushra, good news, that hey, you got this, you got that, you got everything, you got all the luxuries. And on the other side, they are warning them. They say, look, beware, be careful, stay away. You know, this life, this life of this world is a life of necessity. We're only living here because it's necessary to live. We only eat here and drink here so much to be necessary alive. We don't deprive ourselves from the basic necessities of goodness of this life. Otherwise, that's like committing suicide, which is another topic for some other day. So this life is a life of necessity, not a life of luxury. Unfortunately, people who have this imbalance, people who make this life a life of luxury and not necessity, then it creates an imbalance in life. And that's why it changes their priorities and their focus on the wrong things of life. This life is a life of necessity. That life, life of Akhirah, is a life of luxury. Whatever you couldn't accomplish, whatever you couldn't achieve, whatever you couldn't acquire, whatever you aspired to be, aspired to become, whatever you desire to have, and you didn't get it, don't worry. He will come in Akhirah. You know, one time Rasulullah was lying down on his bed. It was so-called bed. It was just a thin sheet of thing on the floor that he put down. And he was lying down for sleep. And Umar ibn Khattab came to him and he sat down right next to him. And he was just silent, Umar ibn Khattab. And he was looking at the sleeping bed of Rasulullah. He was looking around in the house, furniture, no furniture, scarcity of things and all that. So he started crying, quietly started crying. And as you know, the tears that they drip, they come to the beard. And then from the beard, one drop fell on the beloved, blessed palm of Rasulullah. So imagine, visualize like this, that Rasulullah is lying down with his hands like this on the floor, palm. And the drop of tear from over the Khattab's beard lands on that. 
So immediately Rasulullah knew that this is not a sweat. This is a tear from the eyes of, of his companion over the Khattab. So he asked him, you know, ما لك يا عمر? What happened to you, Umar? You know, what is making you cry? So Umar ibn Khattab, in that crying, emotional tune of voice, he said, Ya Rasulullah, you are the king of kings. You are the rahmatul alameen, mercy to the whole world. You are the Sayyidul Mursaleen. You are the master of the prophets, Imamul Anbiya, leader of the prophets. And look at your condition. Look how you're living. You're sleeping on the floor, thin sheet over there, no furniture, no house luxuries, you know. And look at Qais and Qisra. <clears throat> look at the palaces of Qais and Qisra, you know. How they are basking in the luxuries of this world. You know, they have gold utensils, gold doors, golden furniture, whatnot. You know, Qais and Qisra, these two empires, the Byzantine Empire, Roman Empire. Look at their kings, how they look at their furniture, look at their beds even at that time. So Rasulullah kept listening and listening to Umar al-Khattab, the comparison that he was making. And then he just quietly told him, Ya Umar. Lana fil jannah. Lana fil jannah. Three times he repeated, he said, O oh, Omar, for us, for us Muslims, believers, for us, for us who believe in Allah blind, blindly, for us is in Jannah. What is the message Rasulullah is giving? That don't feel deprivation, don't feel deprived that oh, I don't have this, I don't have that luxury, I don't have that luxury, I don't have that. For us is in Jannah. So if I couldn't get that car, my dream car from childhood, no problem, I'll get it in Jannah. If I couldn't get that dream spouse I always visualized and dreamt about, that dream wife, that dream husband, no problem. Jannah. This life is a life necessity. We do things based on necessity and necessary things. And we continue with this life. But this life is not a life of desires, that every desire you have. Imagine what good will be Jannah? How would we feel about Jannah if all our desires were satisfied and relinquished right here in this dunya? That's why the desires, the temptations are here left unaccomplished. Because they will be fulfilled in Jannah. Like Allah says in Surah Fussilat. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَا اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُوا عَلَيْهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ for you in Jannah, O people of Allah, the Salihs of Allah, in Jannah you will have what you ishtahi, ishtaha means desire. Any desire you have in Jannah. Boom, in a snap, in a blink of an eye, or even less than that, it's fulfilled. Here, you have a desire. You have to work hard first to earn the money. Then using that money, you purchase that desire, you buy that desire. And then on top of that, that desire that you bought or purchased, then dwindles down. It withers away. It loses its value over time. What good is it? It's like a mad, dash, crazy, rush cycle, you know, desire money hard work then the money then purchase desire and then the desire goes away that's why allah said anfusukum for you whatever your nafs desires will be there in jannah and also for you in jannah is what you claim or order or ask for that down it that means ask you ask for something you say i want this then you that will be fulfilled in Jannah. But there's something that you don't say from your tongue. You don't say, I want this. Your heart desires, I wish I had that. Boom, it's right in front of that. And you get shocked. In Jannah, you get shocked. Well, I didn't even say it yet. I didn't even bring it out of my tongue yet. I just had a desire in heart. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. This is Jannah. Hello, welcome to Jannah. This is no longer dunya where you desire or you even say something from your mouth with desire and nothing happens. Not an inch moves. This is Jannah, my dear brother, sister Islam, at its best. That whatever we say from our tongue is fulfilled. Whatever we desire in the heart and not yet said from the tongue is fulfilled. As for this life, it's no use chasing desires, chasing desires. Because we're never going to get anywhere chasing desires. 
And that is what Allah SWT says in this ayah here, beautiful ayah 48. 48. The ayah 48, this beautiful, that don't be after the desires. And that's what the goal of Rasulullah was. He was a mubashir and he was a mundir. He was a warner, warning from the calamities and afflictions that would come from disobedience. And he was a glide tiding good news. And look, don't worry about this dunya. You will get everything in Jannah. In fact, when a person goes to Jannah, they will feel like, I wish none of my dua was accepted in dunya. And I, go, and I would have gotten everything. In Jannah. Moving on, next ayah 49. Now we go on to a clear and final warning from Allah in this same passage towards the non believers or the rebellious people that those who deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's signs will be afflicted with punishment for their rebelliousness. Simple as that. Meaning, Allah is saying there is no escape from the punishment of Allah. There is no escape from the afflictions and calamity that comes from Allah based on denying his signs. Now, what is sign? Sign means any kind of reminder Allah sends our way. It could be physical form, spiritual form, mental form, any way that Allah sends a reminder that look, you know, any kind of affliction and calamity that comes in our way on our daily life, we should not look at it as a negative, but rather look at it as a positive that, oh, Allah is reminding me, hey, wake up. Wake up before it's too late. It's a reminder Allah is sending me that, hey, you know, get up and repent to Allah and mend your relationship, reconcile with Allah and be on the path of obedience, not the path of disobedience. That's a sign. Then the last ayah for tonight, ayah number 50, Allah says in verse 50, قُلْ لَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ عِنْدِي خَزَائِنُ اللَّهِ وَلَا أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبَ وَلَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ إِلْنِي مَلَكِ إِنْ أَتَّبِعُ إِلَّا مَا يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الْأَعْمَى وَالْبَصِيرِ أَفَلَا تَتَفَكَّرُونَ This last ayah of this passage which is culminating or concluding the theme of warning for rebelliousness and disobedience, Allah is saying to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, that, O oh, Prophet, peace upon him, say to them, say to the kuffar and mushrikeen of Mecca, قُلْ La aqulu lakum. Say, I do not say to you, Indi, I have khazain, the treasures of Allah, khazain Allah. Meaning, I don't, I'm not a rich man. I'm not a person who has all these huge treasures like Qarun and Firaun and all that. Wala a'lamu. And I also don't know al ghaib, the unseen. I don't know the future. I don't know what's going to happen. Only Allah knows. I only know what Allah tells me. Wala aqulu lakum. Nor do I say to you that I am an angel, malak. Because they accused him that, oh, he is an angel. So Rasulullah is here saying clearly, refuting the claim, I'm not an angel. You know, I don't have the treasures and luxuries of this world. I can't give you anything. I'm empty pocket, empty handed. Nor do I know the future that I can forecast what's going to happen to you. Are you guys going to be good or okay or bad or whatever? Or are you going to Jannah or Jahannam? Allah does, he doesn't know that except what Allah tells him. Nor do I say to you that I am an angel. In illa ma yuha ilay. I only follow what has been ordained to me, revealed to me, which is the Quran. Qul, say to them again, O Prophet of Allah, Muhammad Sallam, Hal yastawi, is it equal? Are those equal? Who? Al A'ma wal Basir? Those who are blind and those who can see, are they equal? No. What's the purpose of mentioning this metaphoric expression? What's the difference between a blind person and a seeing person? The difference is that a, a person who sees can easily detect what are the dangers and what are the things that they need to safeguard themselves from. A blind person cannot see the dangers in front of them, cannot see the perils of life. So they're doomed. That's why if you see a blind person crossing the road and he can't see the car coming, we can see the car coming. We've got to save him. We've got to help him cross the road. A blind person cannot. So a car can come and shoot. So what Allah is saying here, that those who disobey Allah, those who rebel against Allah, they're like blind people. They don't see Naru Jahannam. They don't see Jannah. They don't see the disaster calamity. They're they are like basically dead people. And those who can see are like the people who believe in Allah, believe in Jannah, believe in Akhirah. Those are pe the people who can see are those who obey Allah, who follow Allah's orders, command, who long to meet Allah 
in akhirah and qiyamah so that they can be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. With that, we come to the end of today's passage, verses 40 to 50. Alhamdulillah, we completed 10 ayats today in one session. Akhirah ta'ala, but I mean, wassalatu wassalamu alaykum. Jazakallah khairan, barakallah fiqh, imam jawad for that beautiful session. Uh, inshallah, we'll have, we'll take actually one question for today uh, regarding the verses that we have studied for today. The question is that throughout this whole passage, throughout these uh, 10 verses, we see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is debating and arguing in a way uh, with the mushrikeen of Mecca. Now, the question is that how can we as Muslims over here uh, basically debate in a respectful manner. Again, we don't want to uh, basically put down anyone or basically disrespect anyone, but we want to debate with other people. Maybe they may be our co-workers at work who may be an atheist or maybe someone of any other background. How can we debate with them about different topics about Islam, whether it may be the existence of Allah, whether it may be uh, different other issues, but how can we debate with them? First of all, correction. Allah SWT is not arguing. Allah doesn't argue with people. And he's not debating here. He is giving them warning and he's giving them proofs of legitimacy. It may sound like it's a debate. It's not a debate. Debate means between two equal powers. Allah is not equal to human beings. And Allah does not need to debate with human beings because Allah created them. He's a creator. This is a concept of tawheed, aqidah. Allah, instead of debating, Allah is not debating. Allah is warning them, giving them uh, hindsights, giving them advices. That, look, you do this. Look, you did that. This is what they're. So that is what is our job. And that's why we're debating in Islam is not permissible. It's not good. It may be permissible, but it's not advisable uh, because debates do not convince people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in in this passage trying to can uh, you know uh, prove to them that oh if you don't believe in me it's going to be the end of the world it's going to be their their doomsday so a lot because Allah doesn't want their worship as for your question how we can convince other people uh, with different backgrounds in this world is through warning the same message Allah is telling us to apply in our daily life the same philosophy that Allah has used over here in these 10 ayats is asking us that when we talk to people and we engage with them, we should engage with them in a progressive manner, in a pragmatic manner, in a productive manner to give them, to show them the pluses, the positives and the negatives, to show them the equal two sides so that they can make a, a, a calculated decision. They can make a crucial judgment on their own. What is good for me? What is bad for me? See, the, the theme of these 10 ayahs is Allah is saying the burden of onus of proof lies upon you, O insan. You have to make that choice. You want to go on this path or that path? Especially like the last ayah, you know, say are equal the one who's blind and the one who's uh, able to see. Basically, that's what Allah is saying. You have two paths. You have two choices. Either you can live a blind life and turn your eyes away from the truth from the practicality of this world and universe that Allah has made, or you can be an intelligent person and accept all these things and realize that there's a creator, there's a master, there's a provider, there's a protector, and I have to acknowledge that. So it's that is the strategy that Allah SWT in these 10 ayats are telling us to use when we give da'wah to non-Muslims in our daily lives even today. That instead of debating with them, because debates get us nowhere except to argumentation and back and forth. Allah is not reasoning with them that, okay, I give you a reason, you reason your way. Allah is giving them warning, giving them uh, food for thought, uh, giving equipping them with examples and similes and parables. And look, are you going to be a fool and make wrong choices? Or are you going to be intelligent and make the right and wise choices to be successful. In other words, the bottom line of this whole ayat is that are you going to be a successful person or a failure? Success defined according to Allah, not success defined according to the worldly uh, benchmarks and standards and paradigm. Because a human being who does not believe in Allah may have success defined according to their own wish, women, desire, and benchmarks. But Allah says that success is defined by him in the Quran 
as per these ayats. And it's up to the person if they want to be foolish and and go against this success, or they can be intelligent and accept Allah and accept the belief in His prophets and accept Akhirah and make that intelligent choice and be saved from the wrath and punishment of Allah. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah khaykum. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khair. Inshallah, now we'll be ending this session with dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Asr inna al-insan lafi khusr illa al-lazina amanu wa aminu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haqq wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam wa ilayka yarji'u salam. Tabarakta ya adhi al-jalani wal-ikram. اللهم إنا نعوذ برضاك من سخطك ومعافاتك من عقوبتك وبك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم اجعل اجتماعنا هذا اجتماع مرحومة واجعل تفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما ولا تجعل فينا ولا معنا شقيا ولا محروما اللهم إنا نسألك إيمانا كاملا ويقينا صادقا وتوبة صادقة قبل الموت وراحة عند الموت ورحمة ومغفرة بعد الموت ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم فاغفر لنا ولوالدينا ووالديهم ولجميع المسلمين الأحياء منهم والميتين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل الله وصل على محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين إن شاء الله we will see you next week same time 9 p.m. إن شاء الله so please don't forget to join us والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر